Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today as we learn about the pelvic floor in women's survivorship. For those of you new to the Cancer Wellness Center, I would like to take a minute to tell you more about the center. The Cancer Wellness Center was founded in 1989 as a nonprofit organization with a mission to improve the physical and emotional well being of those impacted by cancer and their families. Our services, which currently are both virtual and in person, include education programs like the one today that aim to help you navigate the very challenges that come with living with a cancer diagnosis, wellness classes like yoga, meditation, stress reduction, exercise, and more that provide a holistic approach to healthy living, and support services including counseling for individuals, families, couples, children, and those bereaved, as well as support groups that are designed to help our participants manage the mental and emotional impact of cancer. If you would like to learn more about the center and connect to our free programs and services, please visit cancerwellness.org and I'll put the chat in, uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, now, before I welcome our presenter, please note that this program is being recorded, as I mentioned earlier, and your audio is disabled. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll address them at the end. Um, I also know questions were submitted ahead of time, um, so Sonali will address those as well. Um, following the program, you will receive a short program evaluation. Um, I do ask that you please take a minute to complete it and share your feedback with us. Um, thank you so much. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, physical therapist Sonali Karnik. Uh, Sonali, thank you so much for being here today. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me here and uh, welcome. Um, I do I, I'm going to, yeah, just a uh, little bit about myself. I've been practicing uh, pelvic floor therapy for um, 10 years. Um, it is a specialization. Um, we are not taught this in school, so we um, choose to uh, specialize in it. Um, and um, I feel like I have found my niche in this area. I'm able to help a lot of people, uh, women and men. Um, and it seems to be a very underserved um, population. Uh, and there are not that many uh, pelvic floor therapists around um, either. Uh, so I'm really uh, thankful that I can help um, my patients. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation. Uh, in a little bit, I'll share my screen. Um, at the end, I have uh, quite a few questions, uh, really good questions that I've received. Uh, hopefully, a lot of them will be answered through the presentation, but I'll go over them anyway at the end. Um, I, a um, little bit more about me, I practice at Vista um, um, Medical Center in the outpatient clinic, which is located in Lindenhurst. Um, so I've been here since 1991. Um, so a lot of uh, experience in the general outpatient area, as well as now in pelvic floor. So I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen now. So. Perfect. Then I'll start the slideshow. So today we're going to talk about the role of pelvic floor rehabilitation in uh, women's cancer survivorship. Um, cancer survivorship in women, uh, some of the common cancers that I see um, in women that affect the pelvic floor are breast cancer, uh, gynecological cancers like cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, vulvar, and then cancers related to the bowel and bladder. Um, as many as two thirds of breast cancer survivors experience one or more long-term adverse effects. Cancer treatment may include surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and or hormonal therapy. And these treatments often have adverse effects on the pelvic floor. Um, more patients are surviving cancer and need help dealing with the effects of cancer treatment. Um, so nearly any cancer can cause uh, late effects. There's a variety of late effects, uh, which could include pelvic pain or bladder pain, urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunction, and then under sexual dysfunction, there are 
a few diagnoses that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, one is vulvodynia, which is actually pain or discomfort around the opening of the vagina. Then there's dyspareunia, which is pain during sex, or vaginismus, uh, which is a tensing or involuntary contraction of the muscles around the vagina. Then there are menopausal symptoms that can occur, changes in mood or sexual desire, fecal incontinence, colorectal conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, hemorrhoids, scarring due to disease or radiation burns. The most common uh, complaints that patients usually come with or have are uh, tightness within the pelvic area or the abdomen, the inner thighs, the hips and buttock muscles. Um, there's tightness in the pelvic floor musculature, which then causes changes in elasticity of that, uh, those muscles, uh, which then results in pain with sexual intercourse or uh, urinary and bowel impairments, like urgency, frequency, difficulty emptying the bladder and constipation. Then there's the uh, result of post-operative scarring, uh, which causes pain. There could be lack of mobility. And then there is hypersensitivity along the scar. Then there's radiation therapy that itself can cause scarring and uh, causes narrowing of the vaginal canal or the urethra or the rectum, which can result in pain with sex, voiding, etc. Research has shown that pelvic floor rehabilitation can help ease these adverse effects and improve quality of life. Studies have shown that improvements in pain, sexual function, urinary symptoms, anxiety from pain, body image issues, and depressive symptoms are sustained and meaningful even one year after pelvic floor treatment in cancer survivors with dyspareunia, which is uh, pain with um, sex. So next slide, um, the, what are the benefits of the of pelvic floor rehabilitation? We can help with pain reduction, improving the strength and restoration of the muscle tone of the pelvic floor musculature. We can improve flexibility, increase in blood flow to the pelvic region, improvement in sexual response and function, prevention and treatment of urinary leakage, urgency and frequency, improvement in bowel incontinence, constipation, diarrhea, and generally improvement in quality of life. So what is uh, the pelvic floor? Uh, as you can see the little picture at the bottom, um, the pelvic floor uh, musculature is a group of muscles and connective tissue that layers down the pelvic region and uh, it supports the pelvic organs, bladder, uterus, and bowel. So picture that you're looking at, um, you can see the spine in the back and the, the pubic bone um, in the front and the pelvic floor is all along the bottom over here. It, it is kind of like a hammock or a sling and it suspends all the organs, pelvic organs. Um, they stretch all the way from the pubic bone in the front and to the tailbone in the back. And these muscles control the bowel, bladder and sexual function by working in a balanced and coordinated contraction and relaxation. So I'm gonna show you um, a picture from the top. You can see um, kind of looks like a hammock at the bottom and all the organs sit right on top of it. The next one is a closer picture and the pelvic floor actually has three layers. So the one right on top is actually the third layer, which is attached directly to the bladder in the front, the uterus in the middle and the rectum in the back. And then this is the second layer. And then below that is the first layer, which is uh, attached to the opening of the urethra in the front, uh, the vagina and the anus. Um, so those are the three layers of the pelvic floor. I can see how it forms a little uh, suspension or a hammock. Um, so a little bit about how it functions and how it's related um, to um, the female or the male. Uh, 
organs and dysfunction. So on your left is a male anatomy and then the female anatomy is in this box here. But to your extreme right, uh, it's an easier diagram. And when I show it to you with the bladder anatomy, it's a little bit easier to understand than with the uh, bowel or the um, uterus. So it's the same muscle group that attaches to all three organs. So this one here, you can see this bulb here, this is the bladder. It's a section taken longitudinally and uh, it is controlled by muscles. Um, they actually call it detrusor muscles, but we call it bladder muscles. And then they lead to an opening here, which is the urethra. So the urethra has the sphincter muscles on the side, which help with the opening and closing of the urethra. And then the bladder has these muscles, which help with the contraction and relaxation of the bladder. The pelvic floor muscles are attached in this area where the urethral uh, sphincter muscles are. So the next slide will show a little bit about the functioning of the bladder in relation to the pelvic floor and the sphincter. So usually our bladder has a capacity of about 400 milliliters. Um, so when it is empty and now it's ready to start filling, bladder here is relaxed so that it can start filling up. And the urethral sphincter is contracted along with the pelvic floor, which is contracted so that this opening is closed and the bladder can fill. Then when the bladder fills a little bit, say maybe 120 to 150 ml, you start first feeling that, that sensation that you need to pee soon but you can still hold it generally. And um, so it continues, the bladder continues to stay relaxed. The sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles are still contracted and this opening is closed. Then gradually, you, when you decide that you wanna go to the bathroom, uh, the detrusor muscles or the muscles of the bladder start contracting and the bladder starts contracting. And then the urethral sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles start relaxing so that this, op this opens and then the urine can pass through. And so once you've emptied your bladder, it starts again with the bladder relaxing and the sphincter and the pelvic floor contracting. So this contraction of the bladder and relaxation of the um, pelvic floor has to be very coordinated. They work in opposition to each other. When the bladder relaxes, the pelvic floor contracts. When the bladder contracts, the pelvic floor relaxes in order for normal micturation or normal urination to occur. So when there is any dysfunction or dyssynergy um, or in coordination between the pelvic floor and the bladder muscles, um, we have a problem. Um, usually the dysfunction has two aspects to it. One is you could have hypertonia or the tone is high or there's tightness or spasm. It's one and the same really, where the muscles are shortened. And so there is a lack of relaxation. In order to relax the, uh, the muscle, uh, in order for it to be in its full length needs to relax. But if it cannot, then it causes difficulty with emptying the bladder, retention of urine, constipation and painful sex. The other dysfunction that can occur is weakness in the pelvic floor muscles, um, which prevents the bladder from filling up. And therefore you have urinary or bowel leakage. You can have frequency, et cetera. So sometimes you can have one or the other, or you can have both. Generally you have both because one causes the other. If there is tightness in a muscle, it's going to eventually get weak because it can't get to its full length in order to function at its best. So they generally go hand in hand. Um, pelvic floor therapists receive training to evaluate and treat conditions involving the pelvic region, the abdomen, hip, the lumbosacral area, the spine, the groin. So we get trained in that area. And so the most common findings that we see are generally pain, 
uh, muscle tension or guarding, tightness, weakness, change in elasticity, scarring, and hypersensitivity. It could be all of the above, or it could be some of these um, that can still cause dysfunction. So in a physical therapy assessment, um, once you come in with a script from the doctor uh, for pelvic floor rehabilitation, um, we go through a very detailed history about what actually brings has brought you here, what the patient came here for. Uh, and included in that history is uh, the date of the last pelvic exam, the date of the last urine analysis, because very often if you have a urinary tract infection, that um, needs to be ruled out because those symptoms can mask uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. Sometimes even after a UTI, you can come up with issues with uh, pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. So uh, it's it's good to know when the last urine analysis was done. Then the occurrence of incontinence, and this could be the bladder or bowel, um, whether it you'd come with no incontinence at all, or sometimes it's less than one time a month, it could be less than one time a week. So we just need to know um, what the frequency of incontinence is, if there is any. Then uh, number of leaks per day, what protection uh, does the patient use? Uh, either they don't need to use protection. Sometimes they may use just panty shields, mini pads, maxi pads, um, or uh, bladder control type diapers. Then the severity of leakage, whether it's no leakage, few drops, or the underwear is saturated. And uh, position during leakage, whether the patient uh, has leakage when they are lying down, sitting, standing, change in position, sometimes just getting out of bed or sit to stand uh, can cause some leakage. Then there's activity that can cause uh, urine loss. It could be vigorous or moderate or even light. Uh, sometimes no activity can cause leakage. Uh, so what type of activity? Could it be coughing, sneezing, laughing that can cause? Do you hear running water and you need to go? So those sort of uh, things we uh, look for. And the frequency of urination during the day. Um, generally, if you're going more than six or seven times, then it's a little bit of a red flag. Uh, usual uh, time between voids is about two to two and a half hours. They used to say that you should be able to watch a full movie without having to use the restroom. Um, so that's the general norm. Um, so do you go eight to 12 times or more? And at night, usually one to two times is also normal, uh, but do you go more often than that? Uh, do you wet the bed? Um, then fluid intake, how many ounces a day? Because um, if it's too much of hydration or if the kind of drink that you drink, caffeine can cause uh, increased urination, um, diuretics, you know, uh, watermelon uh, can cause uh, diuresis. So um, it's good to know how much fluid intake one takes so that we can compare to see if it is something because of the intake or if it's something else that maybe the patient is not emptying enough, therefore they are going more frequently. Um, then are you sexually active? Um, are you pregnant or attempting pregnancy? The number of pregnancies or complications with pregnancies. A lot of the times uh, they do episiotomies. You know, it used to be a time when you could have a normal delivery and there would be an, just a tear. Um, and that is better than an episiotomy. Episiotomy is done to help with the delivery, but then it, 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 you're cutting into ligaments and tissue that actually um, eventually then end up causing issues like um, leakage and pain, scarring. Uh, so we like to know if uh, the patient has had episiotomy. Um, then we do an external and internal assessment. In the external assessment, generally, and uh, 
besides um, the assessment of the entire body, I mean, we'll do range of motion of the trunk, of the hips, um, you know, general um, strength and um, range of motion exam. But then we hone into the pelvic floor uh, because we want to rule out everything else and then come to what the specific problem is. So when we start uh, with the pelvic floor exam part of it, um, we look at um, what if there is any gapping or how the skin integrity is around the opening of the urethra, of the vagina, of the anus. Um, the quality of the opening, if there is any asymmetry, if it is loose or if it's too tight, um, we have the patient squeeze and then we look at the quality of the squeeze to see if uh, there is any asymmetry in that or if sometimes a patient may not be able to squeeze at all. Um, then palpation, uh, we call it the pelvic clock. So if you can imagine that whole area, um, uh, like a clock and we go from all the way from um, 12 o'clock all around one to back again to 12. And we palpate with a Q-tip to see if there's any tenderness in, say if you have a tenderness in uh, at five o'clock, it coincides with the muscle inside. So it you know gives us information that, okay, there might be a problem in that region. Um, then the internal assessment is uh, usually, you know, um, the whole thing with that exam part of the pelvic floor may take like three to five minutes, it won't take very long. Um, so you assess it uh, with a gloved finger, um, lubricated, and we palpate um, first externally, and then we go internally into the vagina. That's the easiest. Uh, for men, we would have to do a rectal exam, but for women, it is through the vagina, and uh, we feel for any tender spots if the sensation is normal. Uh, the tone of that um, musculature. Because as soon as you enter, you get through the first layer, then you go into the second layer and then the third layer. So you're not very deep. It's about maybe the length of a, an index finger. And so you go through all three layers to see if there is any localized abnormality. Um, then we have a test to check uh, prolapse because um, with uh, Repeated deliveries are more, you know, even a single delivery uh, pregnancy can cause a prolapse if the delivery was difficult and you were pushing really hard. So we look for um, prolapse. The anterior wall prolapse is when the bladder um, gets into the vaginal wall, uh, and the posterior wall uh, prolapse is when the rectum goes into the vaginal wall. So we try to see if there's any prolapse. And generally, uh, if someone has prolapse up to stage two, physical therapy can definitely help. If it's beyond three or at the uh, stage four, then um, it would have to be surgery. Uh, physical therapy has limited uh, uh, use in that severe of prolapse because then there is a lot more structural damage. Then we do uh, muscle testing. Again, with the finger uh, in the vagina, we check um, the strength on a zero to five scale. And um, if you squeeze my finger uh, just enough to hold my finger, it would be like a three out of five. If it's less than that, it would be two. If it's just a flicker, it would be one. And there, if there's no feeling at all of squeezing, it would be a zero. And uh, four would be where you squeeze it um, well, and um, I feel some force. And then five would be when you actually pull my finger in. Um, so that's how we measure the strength. And we do what's called a PERF um, scale. PRF is an acronym. Uh, P stands for power, E is for endurance, R is for repetitions, and F is for fast twitch. So in power, I would ask you to squeeze my finger and I'll see if you can hold it for 10 seconds. And I would give you the strength on a zero to five scale, uh, how strong that contraction was. And I would ask you to hold it for 10 seconds and maybe you can hold it just for five seconds and that would be your endurance. And I'll see how many repetitions you do with the strength that whatever your original strength was and your endurance was 
at five seconds, how many repetitions you can do at that strength. And then fast, which is um, trying to squeeze and relax, squeeze and relax as fast as you can in 10 seconds. So that again gives us a very objective um, measurement of where the impairment lies. Um, then there is the Marinoff scale. It is a scale for dyspareunia, which is pain with sex, and uh, it's graded on a zero to three scale. The higher the number here, the worse the impairment is. So you wanna be at a zero where, um, depending on how much pain or if you are able to complete intercourse or not, or you cannot have intercourse at all, we decide accordingly on the number then. Um, some of the assessment forms, uh, there is a bladder diary and I'll talk more about it um, in the later uh, slide. Also the bowel diary. Uh, and depending on whether the patient has come in for, for a bowel issue or a bladder issue, and sometimes it's both, um, then um, I have them fill that out. Uh, it's kind of like a log, a 24 hour log. And um, I may have them fill out maybe five logs for the week or maybe three logs for the week, depending on how I feel, how intense the issue might be. And uh, that gives me, uh, it would give me a, an idea of uh, troubleshooting or figuring out um, problem solving. And um, that will help in patient education uh, or behavioral changes or dietary changes. Uh, then we have uh, functional scales. These are tools that we use to uh, ask questions which are subjective, but we get an objective measurement for it. Um, there's one for uh, the bladder, which is a quality of life symptom distress inventory that actually covers um, the bladder and uh, the um, sexual and the rectal issues. Uh, then there is P PFDI 20 for colorectal issues. And then there's the vulva pain uh, functional questionnaire for pain. So this is just an uh, example of a bladder diary. Um, so you can see, and there are plenty out there you can use or you can make your own as well. Um, I have a different one that we use here, uh, but on the left side, you can see that there's um, the time. It's a 24 hour um, log from 6 a.m. and it ends at 6 a.m. And it tells you uh, to fill out what kinds of fluids you drank, whether it was water, whether it was Coke, iced tea, um, coffee, and how much of it. Um, so say you wake up and drink, um, you know, at six o'clock some water. And so how much water, a cup of water, then did you uh, urinate uh, how many times in that six to eight a.m. period? Uh, once, twice. So whenever you urinate, you would put a check in. Say you urinated at 2 p.m. You check there. And how much did you urinate? Uh, General would be small, medium, large, but I like to tell my patients to actually count how many seconds, um, one second, two seconds, you know, count. That gives me a little bit better idea because the normal amount of time to urinate lies somewhere between 14 to 16 seconds. And um, it can be more, especially in the morning after a full night's sleep or when you've had a lot to drink, um, you, you, more is okay. Um, so, but sometimes um, if it is less than that, then again, it's a red flag um, as to what's going on. Is the patient not uh, emptying the bladder? Are they going too frequently because they're feeling that urgency? Um, so that gives me some information. Uh, then the next question would be, do you feel a strong urge to urinate? Yes, no. Um, did you leak any urine? How many times did you leak? How much did you leak? Was it a small amount, just few drops, a lot? And then the activity when you were doing, when it leaked or when you had that urgency. And the same goes for the bowel diary too. Um, a similar thing, what you ate, when you ate, how much you ate, um, when did you go? Did you have any leakage? What were you doing when you had leakage? So those sort of questions uh, would be on those uh, logs. And the treatment options um, would start with 
manual therapy. So manual therapy would be um, usually I do external as well as internal manual therapy. A lot of the times patients come with pain, not just in the uh, general area, but they may have pain in the pelvic area, lower abdomen, in the low back area, uh, in the thighs. So I may start with some manual therapy in uh, those areas first to release a soft tissue. And then I would go in uh, manual therapy uh, through the vagina or the rectum. And um, next would be therapeutic exercise. And none of this is in any order. Um, whichever I feel uh, during my session would be best to start with, I do. Um, therapeutic exercises include stretching exercises, strengthening exercises, and mobility exercises. And it's not just for the pelvic floor, but it includes general body. Um, something like hamstring stretching or even a heel cord stretching, um, hip muscle stretching, all those can contribute to tightnesses or issues in the pelvic floor. So we um, do pretty much the whole uh, body exercise. Um, then there's biofeedback with EMG. So what biofeedback um, looks like is I'm going to just jump a couple of slides here. So this is an EMG sensor. There are very many different uh, companies have come up with it. So this is just one company. And um, on the right here, there's this sensor, which is a vaginal sensor. And we introduce that with a lubricant straight into the vagina. They also have rectal sensors, which are slightly thinner than this. And you go in all the way uh, to the uh, end of this um, sensor right here. And it is attached to this little gadget. And we attach this to, I have it on my laptop. So we have a program that then will show you on the screen what the muscles are doing. Um, there, these are some other units. Um, kind of look like a small TENS unit. Uh, the same units can be used for, uh, usually there's a biofeedback unit and then there's an electrical stimulation unit. So the units are separate, but you can use the same sensor for both. Um, and this is what an EMG would look like. Um, in this person, they use two channels with um, channel B is at the bottom and blue is actually using an abdominal electrode. Uh, they're like just sticky electrodes that we put on the uh, stomach. And then green is the vaginal or the rectal electrode. Uh, the reason we use sometimes use both is uh, you want to incorporate other muscles like the abdominal muscles to help train the pelvic floor. Um, very often I do not use the second um, channel B, I just use the vaginal or the rectal. Um, in this person, uh, how it goes, you can program it however you want it. In this person, you can say they're contracting for, you know, 10 seconds and then they're relaxing for five seconds. Um, but they seem to have really high tone. It looks like it's uh, closer to 70 or 80. Um, it's it's in microvolts. Um, usual normal tone is less than two microvolts. So this person has really high um, tone and they're not able to relax because in that period of five seconds, when you relax, your tone should come down um, significantly. And this person uh, is just an example. Uh, it does not show that relaxation. So I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. So biofeedback then when you when the patient gets to see on the screen um, what they're doing, what their tone is, and they work with it, they are able to then go back home and replicate that kind of contraction and relaxation. They, then you kind of know that, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Because when you ask someone to just squeeze your pelvic floor or just do Kegels, we kind of squeeze everything. We squeeze our buttocks, we squeeze our thighs, we squeeze our tummy. 
Uh, but if you want to really get to um, the pelvic floor, uh, you need a little bit of a feedback. Um, so the electrode helps or a finger helps. Um, same thing with the electrical stimulation. With the electrical stimulation, it's a little different uh, in the sense that you are giving, the, the machine is giving the stimulation and you'd use this or we'd use this only if there is so much weakness that a person has a strength of less than two out of five. Um, for someone who has a strength of more than two out of five, I do not use electrical stimulations. I go to, with biofeedback and EMG. And the EMG helps because you can compare each session to the previous session. When you establish a baseline, you can go back to see where you were at and where you've improved, where you need more improvement. Um, so it gives you a lot more information um, to be more effective. Uh, then there are proprioceptive devices. Again, um, like you can't, it's hard to do blindly um, to target those muscles. So things like vaginal weights or cones, condoms with marbles, or even just a sensor and electrodes, those can help you feel um, whether you're squeezing the pelvic floor or not. You can use your own finger as well um, to see if you're squeezing uh, the pelvic floor muscles or not. Um, patient education uh, is important. And I think that is 75% of what I do uh, per session, I think, um, because ongoing with each session, um, be you know, troubleshoot, problem solve, teach the patient how to alter things, why this is happening, um, and try to figure out how to help uh, them. And it could be education on diet or nutrition or what foods to avoid, what drinks to avoid, or what to eat. Um, what are the foods that irritate the bowel or the bladder? Uh, what are the drinks that irritate the bladder? Um, so a lot of it is also to do with behavioral changes. Some adjustments uh, need to be made. Um, we also teach patients techniques of how to feel uh, that you're doing the right contraction of the right muscles. Um, so a lot of um, assistance is required um, with the bladder. Um, and even with the bowel, it, it's almost like a child. You get trained. The bowel and bladder gets trained in a certain way. And so we have to retrain it, um, readjust it. And that is a little hard for a lot of people to do, um, to learn something new or train the, retrain the bladder is, is hard. So we go through a lot of education uh, with that. Then there's home exercises. Um, so as we go through exercises in the clinic, we give um, exercises for the patient to do because generally I see patients only once a week. So a lot of it, a lot of homework has to be done by the patient and we help with that. Uh, we print out exercises. And um, so if they're regular uh, with their exercises, they will, they do notice a significant change in a short period of time. And then the Last part is postural education. I think we all can do with some postural education. We get into bad habits. And so we um, reinforce um, good habits and teach uh, or make patients more aware of how they can help themselves uh, improve their posture. We went through that. So some of the um, diagnoses that we come across, um, I put in here um, most of the common ones. Uh, the first one was uh, is urinary incontinence. This is the most um, that I see. Uh, I would say 50% of my patients come with urinary incontinence um, of some sort. Uh, definition is leaking of urine that you cannot control. And uh, types of incontinence are, there are different kinds. Uh, one is stress incontinence. That is when you leak urine, when you cough or sneeze or lift something heavy. Basically, when you increase the pressure in your abdomen, there is leakage. 
uh, laughing can cause leakage and that it would be stress incontinence. Then there's urge incontinence. When you have a sudden intense urge to urinate followed by an involuntary loss of urine. And for with this, you may need to urinate often. Then there is overflow incontinence. When you experience frequent or constant dribbling of urine, if your bladder doesn't empty completely. Then there is functional incontinence is if you cannot get to the toilet in time due to physical or mental impairment. And mixed incontinence is where you experience more than one type of urinary incontinence. So generally when uh, you come uh, to physical therapy, you may come with one of these diagnoses that the doctor might have given, or when I do the evaluation, I can uh, figure out uh, generally what kind of incontinence you may have through my questions or uh, history taking. Um, treatment for it would be, again, exercises for mobility, for stretching, for strengthening, and then targeted pelvic floor exercises. Um, also pelvic floor exercises that are included with the other exercises. For example, if someone says that I leak urine when I sit to stand, then I would have them do pelvic floor, eventually pelvic floor exercises when they are doing that particular movement or when they're going up and down stairs, you would um, do your pelvic floor exercises uh, during that activity. Uh, manual therapy, uh, which helps with down training. Now, down training is basically relaxation, bringing that tone down um, so that the pelvic floor can relax enough in order to allow the bladder to empty. So we not only do strengthening of the pelvic floor, but we also have to do down training. And I think down training is probably the most challenging for most people because it's really hard for us to learn to relax. Um, so that's um, we, we help with that. Then it could be uh, electrical stimulation if somebody is really weak, or below a two out of 10. Um, otherwise, we do biofeedback with EMG for both down training as well as up training, which is strengthening. Um, then bladder retraining, um, bladder retraining through education, through um, changes in behavior, um, and then maintaining uh, the bladder log and patient education. Then the next one um, is vaginismus, which is involuntary spasm in the vaginal musculature when something is entering it, like a tampon or during sex. Um, there are patients who can clamp up really tight. Um, the spasm is not in their control. They, um, they are not able to introduce even during a gynecological exam, um, a speculum or um, even my finger, uh, sometimes it's hard for even the finger to enter the vagina because the spasm is so severe. Um, so the symptoms are generally pain with penetration, a fear of pain or sex. There's loss of sexual desire. I mean, when you're hurting, then you're not going to want to have sex. And then so the treatment is again, pelvic floor exercises for down training or up training, usually uh, it, because it is something to do with spasm, it's, there's increased tone. So we really want to work on relaxation and down training. But eventually when the spasm lasts for a long period of time, uh, you're going to end up with weakness in the pelvic floor. So we work on strengthening as well. Then there's manual therapy, biofeedback with EMG, and then we use dilators. Dilators help with stretching the opening and it helps with relaxation and um, patient education. Sometimes uh, there are dilators out there that are that you can use uh, as a heating pad or a cold pack even. So you can freeze it or you can uh, warm it and uh, the heat or the cold helps the muscles to relax. Uh, so it's just like any other muscle on the external. Uh, if you have a neck pain or shoulder blade pain, we use hot packs, cold packs and um, that helps relax. Uh, stretching helps, so dilators help with that, stretching. Um, then there's dyspareunia, which is pain with sexual intercourse at the vaginal opening or deep in the pelvis. So symptoms are usually feelings of discomfort, burning or throbbing, 
and it could be located in one area or in the general genital area. So I've had patients where um, they, they're able to tolerate sex to a certain extent, but the thrusting is very painful or there's pain in the stomach or in the lower abdomen, which can last for um, a couple of days even afterwards. So um, the, it could be a variety of um, symptoms uh, in, in intensity could be very severe to um, just in a small area. And the causes could be scarring from surgery or radiation. It could be vaginal dryness from medication, hormonal changes, or a reduced elasticity. And the treatment again is exercises, um, the same thing for stretching, mobility, for strengthening. Then there's manual therapy for stretching, relaxation, mobilization. Then we can use biofeedback with EMG for relaxation, which is down training, um, as well as strengthening, and then vaginal dilators and education. Then there's pelvic pain. Uh, again, pelvic pain uh, could be in the lower abdominal area. It very often radiates down into the thighs. It could be in your low back. Um, so the treatment is with exercise, uh, stretching, strengthening, mobility, um, manual therapy with soft tissue mobilization in the pelvic area and in the back or in the thighs, uh, myofascial release. Uh, we have various techniques for that. Um, there's passive stretching that the therapist will do. Um, there's scar mobilization and range of motion. Then we can do biofeedback and EMG and patient education. And for all these conditions, we it's not just limited to what I've mentioned. It, we could add more or we could use just a few modalities uh, rather than all of them, depending on the patient's needs. Uh, then there are bowel issues. There are various types of bowel issues. There's constipation, there's diarrhea, there's irritable bowel syndrome, then there is scarring, there's incontinence. And uh, management of bowel issues uh, starts with keeping a bowel log. Um, like I said, among other things, it helps with problem solving, keeping track of progress or lack of it. Why hasn't it improved? You know, that's an important question. So we look at uh, the log and see if there's anything that we missed. Uh, then we make behavioral or dietary modifications. The log should include consistency of bowels, uh, frequency, if there's any urgency, if there's any leakage, um, food intake, how much and what kind of food is eaten. And the treatment again is uh, exercise, manual therapy, electrical stimulation, especially if there is leakage, uh, it's possible that it's because of weakness. Um, therefore, we, we can use electrical stimulation. And then there's biofeedback with EMG and patient education. And bowel issues, again, can be managed in the female through the vagina or the rectum. And in the male, it would have to be managed through the rectum. Um, so this is uh, called the Bristol stool form scale, and uh, a patient can, uh, fill, you know, circle what kind of stools they have. That like it could be a variation of a few of them, or it could be the same kind. Uh, generally, type four and type three are um, in the normal range, and then there's variations above and below that, uh, right from hard lumps. Um, to sausage shaped but lumpy. And then there is uh, the other extreme is entirely liquid or there's mushy stool. Um, so we have the patient um, fill that out. So now we get to the part where uh, I'll show you some slides with exercises. Again, um, these are not suggestions for anyone to do these exercises, but these are some examples of what we have patients do. Um, there are, um, these are relaxation exercises which uh, help stretch and relax the pelvic floor. Uh, most important is diaphragmatic breathing, uh, breathing exercises. Very often, um, even while I'm doing biofeedback, 
uh, I can see it on the screen. Patients, when they talk or they are, they, there is a change in their breathing, it will make a difference in the, um, what the screen looks like. So suddenly there will be an increase in tone. So uh, when you say cough, there is increase in tone and the opposite happens when you relax and the tone reduces. So we can use breathing exercises to actually help with reducing the tone and bringing some relaxation. Then the second one is child's pose. Yes, stretching your entire lumbar spine here, uh, your tailbone as well, and stretching your um, pelvic area. And then this happy baby pose, also it's helping you stretch your um, genital area and your buttock area, um, your lower back. It's a great exercise. And this yogi squat, not everybody can do this. I cannot do it. Uh, you have to hold on to a chair or something to be able to do half squat. But it's a great exercise for those um, who can do it. Again, um, this is a position where the pelvic floor completely relaxes. So people with uh, bowel issues, um, this is a great exercise to do. Uh, or even squat and um, to have a bowel movement in this position, um, it opens up the rectum in order to have a uh, empty the uh, have a really great bowel movement. And then this is the sphinx pose uh, where you're stretching your abdominals in the front and you're using your back extensors and just a really good exercise in uh, what we call the anti gravity muscles in the back, which again helps with the pelvic floor. Um, how we uh, progress with exercises um, in therapy is we first start with basics. Um, so, and I'm just going to um, focus on the pelvic floor exercises because I do do others. Uh, like I said, the stretching of the calves, the hamstrings. We start with some warm ups, maybe on a bike or a, or the new step, um, and then uh, we gradually go on to the mat table. And uh, when we start with the pelvic floor uh, pro uh, exercises, usually it would be squeezing your pelvic floor um, for maybe 10 seconds if you can and do for 10 reps. Um, you lie on your back um, with your knees bent and your feet on the mat and just um, squeeze your pelvic floor. Uh, kind of like uh, how to cue in is try to uh, prevent gas from passing. Um, and just squeeze your pelvic floor, you hold it for 10 seconds and then relax. Sometimes I also cue in patients, like think of it as an elevator and you're at the uh, first floor and you want to squeeze the pelvic floor. So you're bringing it up towards your nose and uh, you're holding it for about five seconds and you're going from the first floor to the second floor to the third floor, hold it there and then you come back down and not just stop at the first floor, but you go all the way down to the basement. And then you come back to neutral, which is the first floor. So I kind of cue patients in. Um, and important is try not to squeeze your buttocks if you can, or don't hold your breath. Don't bring your abdominals in. Just focus on your pelvic floor. Then you progress it with number of sets. Maybe increase it to two sets of 10. Uh, maybe do 20 repetitions. Uh, increase your hold. If the patient can't do more than uh, five seconds, then gradually increase it to 10 seconds. Um, I generally stop with 10 seconds and then I do more of repetitions or sets, increase in sets. Then you can also advance uh, using position changes via co-contractions. What it means is like if you were doing a bridge, say. So you can do a bridge in which you're contracting your buttock muscles and your abdominals, and then you squeeze both those muscles and then squeeze your pelvic floor. Uh, or you could be on all fours and you can pull your tummy up and squeeze your pelvic floor in. So different positions, um, you can add other muscle groups in um, to advance. Then functional retraining. So if, like I said before, if you have leakage, when you sit to stand, then you have them Patients do pelvic floor squeezes when you're doing sit to stand um, or squeeze with sneeze. Um, there is a 
a term called NAC, and K N A C K. It's not um, an acronym, but it's what we tell patients to do if they leak when they cough or they sneeze. Uh, you squeeze your pelvic floor and then you cough. So when you know that you're about to squeeze, uh, about to sneeze, then you just squeeze your pelvic floor and that'll prevent you from leaking. Um, if you are going to lift something and you know that you're going to leak, then squeeze your pelvic floor and then lift. Uh, so that sort of retraining uh, we do. Uh, then we incorporate in our activities of daily living, say after using the toilet, um, do some squeezes or with sexual activity, uh, squeeze. Um, and then uh, with gym workouts, you can uh, on and off uh, squeeze your pelvic floor and relax. So you don't have to do too many of those contractions, but just on and off, um, you can do them. Um, the most ideal uh, research has shown is that if you can do eight contractions of pelvic floor muscles three times a day is very effective. So up to eight contractions, squeeze, hold 10 seconds and relax. Do those eight times and do it three times a day. And you will notice the difference. And then you progress to a maintenance dose uh, or a maintenance program, uh, whatever home exercise program you have come up with. You can uh, do it either daily or every other day. Um, initially, when you first start uh, therapy, the first couple months, you probably be um, asked to do those every day, and then you gradually can reduce the amount of time. Um, um, number of days in a week that you do these exercises. Um, so these are some pictures of um, pelvic floor exercises that we show patients. This is a bridge. Again, you can squeeze your pelvic floor uh, along with your buttocks in here. Um, the next one is where you're going to pull your tummy in and squeeze your pelvic floor and then lift one knee up. Hold it for five seconds, bring it back down. Relax your abdominals, relax your pelvic floor, take a couple of breaths and then repeat with the other side. And then maybe do it 10 times on each side. And this is a bridge on a Swiss ball. This is someone who's just seated. Um, sometimes if patients have a hard time, even on the mat table, figuring it out, uh, if they are squeezing correctly or not, um, sitting in, in the chair and doing your pelvic floor helps because you have a little feedback from the surface that you're sitting on. And you can bring in your abdominals at the same time too, to help you squeeze, hold, and then relax. Um, this is a seated leg lift. Um, you saw it earlier in lying down. So you just uh, squeeze and then lift one knee up, relax, and then do the opposite. And here, um, the picture shows uh, this lady uh, doing the EMG while doing exercises. So you can see on the screen then what your pelvic floor is doing while you're exercising. Then you can increase or decrease your contraction or relaxation accordingly with that visual feedback. And uh, what can you expect from therapy? Um, when uh, the clinic that I work in uh, is through Vista Medical Center East, and it's called Vista Ambulatory Care Center um, in Lindenhurst. And we have one-on-one -on -one, uh, care um, and uh, privacy. Usually I see patients once a week for about an hour. Uh, the evaluation may run a little longer. The first session could go up to an hour and a half. And um, I... Uh, send home, uh, you know, send patients home with a bladder or a bowel log um, right from the first day and uh, also give them information about where and how to get the sensor. Um, usually the sensors are not covered by insurance companies, but uh, they are run somewhere between 45 to $60. Um, and you just need one sensor. Um, and you get to take it home and keep it with you and bring it for each session. Um, so that's my phone number at the bottom there. And the next slide is my baby. 
Um, he is actually 11 and a half and potty training has not worked for him uh, as he's getting older. I mean, he got used to um, COVID, uh, the COVID situation with one person being at home, you know, throughout the day, taking him for walks. And now he's sort of rebelling a little bit. And so I got him this little uh, training uh, pad, which is like a litter box. It has pads at the bottom, but he has decided to use it like his day bed at the moment. So uh, one of us takes him for three walks, uh, one in the middle of the day still, but um, that part of, he's he's happy. But, um, he's not able to pee on this uh, pad. He uses it as his recreational or a nap, nap time bed. And so questions, I will go through the questions that are listed. Um, a lot of you sent questions and they're great. Um, some of those, I think we've answered, but I will uh, go over them again um, to make sure that I've addressed each question. And then after this, if you all still have some questions, we can take a few more. Um, so the first question, which I cannot see completely on this, uh, screen is would uh, love to know exercises to help build pelvic floor muscles. So I showed you a few. Um, the only one that I can tell you to do is the uh, squeezing, uh, which is like the Kegels. Uh, but Kegels is just one part of pelvic floor exercises. Uh, there is a whole bunch. And if you can uh, isolate your pelvic floor, either using your finger or just sitting on the chair and squeezing, you can use your tummy muscles, hold for uh, five to 10 seconds, um, do eight to 10 reps about three times a day. Uh, at least you can get started with some form of pelvic floor strengthening um, and see if that helps you. Um, what are the exercises for pelvic floor rehab? Uh, just address that. Uh, signs and symptoms of pelvic dysfunction and best exercises. So uh, like we talked, Usually it would be some form of pain or leakage, um, difficulty having a bowel movement or pain with sex. Those are sort of um, signs and symptoms that I need to go see the doctor about this. Very often uh, women tend to just bear it, you know, um, and uh, think that that's just part of life, that if I leak a little bit while going to the bathroom or my underwear is wet, um, it's normal. Uh, but there is help out there. It can be changed. Um, it doesn't require a lot of effort. So um, just a little commitment in the beginning, and then uh, it will improve your quality of life for the rest of your life. So um, are there any special exercises post hysterectomy? Uh, depending on the type of hysterectomy, if it's vaginal or if it's abdominal, uh, the doctors uh, will let you know if when you're ready to start with therapy. And uh, um, yeah, it, we would have to evaluate uh, you to see uh, what would fit you the best and how to mod modify or progress accordingly. So each patient that we see uh, comes with an individual set of issues um, that we look at and then we modify our program accordingly. So there isn't just one, one thing that we do, but it's all customized for each patient. Um, I'm looking to uh, for ways to strengthen pelvic floor, simple exercises that I can do throughout the day. And yeah, that's the one that I told you about to do three times a day. You can start with that. Um, that you could call that Kegels. Um, going over some good exercises to stand, that's again the same. Um, how do I know if and when I need PT? Um, I think I answered that too, depending on your symptoms. Uh, the biggest, uh, I think the earliest one that shows up is usually urinary leakage or that you're running to the bathroom, you can't hold your urine as long, or there may be drops in your underwear. So that's uh, one of those early signs. Are only some PT uh, people trained to teach pelvic floor wellness? Um, yes, it's those who wish to be trained in this um, and they get either certified or they attend courses. 
um, in order to treat patients. Um, so it's not something that uh, is taught in schools. So how do I locate pelvic floor muscles so I know I'm using the right ones to exercise? So you can locate it basically using your finger or when you use a tampon, you can squeeze it. Or during sex, um, you can squeeze the penis. Um, when you're sitting on the chair, I think you get a little bit of a feedback if you pull up uh, towards the ceiling and then uh, relax. Sometimes if your pelvic floor muscles are so weak, you may not know if you're squeezing it without getting some help um, through a therapist. Um, what, should I, what should be done after therapy uh, to maintain a better bladder control? So basically, um, the therapist will help you, guide you through that. Uh, they'll have you um, be set up with a home exercise program and um, bladder maintenance. You'll be trained in how to maintain or how to manage your bladder. Um, how to manage bowel urgency. Um, that, again, would need an evaluation to see why there's bowel uh, urgency. Is it um, a dietary issue? Is it uh, weakness? Is it surgical? Is it um, due to the hormones or radiation? So best would be to get evaluated to see what the issue is so that uh, then it can be addressed uh, quickly. Um, how does pelvic floor PT help to reduce urinary or stool incontinence? I think we went over that. Does an initial, what does an initial assessment look like and what approaches are used to address the problem? So I think we went over that, um, the initial assessment and um, what we look at to address uh, various problems that a patient may have. Um, I've just started pelvic floor therapy at the recommendation of my acupuncturist. My oncologist never mentioned or recommended, is this a newer type of treatment? Um, it has existed for a while. In fact, when I went 10 years ago for uh, the course, um, people who were teaching the course had over 14 years of um, experience in that field. So it's been around for 25 years, I would imagine. So it's not a newer type of treatment, I don't think, uh, doctors or oncologists are have been trained or aware that this is um, out there or that there are pelvic floor therapists out there. It's just, I think, a matter of uh, awareness and it is growing. So more people are, are being recommended for uh, therapy. Um, can weakness in the pelvic floor lead to fecal incontinence or is that usually due to a different cause? It could be. Um, so again, it would need to be evaluated to see if there is any uh, dietary issue going on or if there's any scarring or uh, surgical issue. So um, that needs to be, all of that needs to be looked at uh, to then come to the conclusion that it is only the pelvic floor. Um, how long after cancer treatment do incontinence and constipation issues usually occur and how long does pelvic floor treatment take? Um, it, it varies. Um, incontinence and constipation issues depending on the site of the cancer, the type of treatment um, could be imaged or it could be a late effect. It could happen even six months later. Um, and usually pelvic floor treatment is not a one-time treatment. Um, I see patients on an average of for 12 weeks. It's once a week, but 12 weeks. Sometimes it could be less. Sometimes it could be more depending on the severity of the issue. Um, surprise to your pelvic floor issues can relate to constipation. Interested to hear more about this? Yeah, definitely, because it um, connects all three portions, the bladder, the uterus, and the bowel. Um, what can I do to help with frequent urination, especially at night, and extreme pain during sexual intercourse? So um, frequent urination at night, generally, uh, to start with, uh, without doing an evaluation or going into any details, the easiest 
could be um, not having any fluids after seven o'clock if you can help it before bedtime, like two hours before bedtime, don't drink anything. That may change um, urination at night um, in the simplest form of an issue. If there is, you know, the, the frequent urination at night could have other causes too, but you could try this method. Um, extreme pain during sexual intercourse could have various um, reasons. And if it is extreme, then I think um, getting it evaluated by a gynecologist or your primary care and getting a uh, referral for a um, pelvic floor therapist would uh, be a good course of action. So those were the questions I got. Um, and Savina will help me um, if there are any further questions that need yeah, to be so we did have a couple that came into the chat, um, which is one of them, if you could talk, it was at the beginning when you were explaining the anatomy of the pelvic floor. Um, and the question that came in is what happens to the pelvic floor um, when the uterus is removed in a surgical procedure? So when the uterus is removed, the organ is removed, the pelvic floor remains uh, there. It does affect the pelvic floor in the sense that when, depending again on whether it's vaginal or whether it's uh, abdominal, some um, uh, ligaments or soft tissue is um, affected uh, directly, either it's cut or um, there's scarring that comes in after um, a hysterectomy. So then uh, you may or may not have issues with the pelvic floor. So if you uh, start to feel any of those um, symptoms or signs uh, like leakage or pain or uh, issues with constipation or diarrhea, then you might want to talk to your doctor and uh, um, see if we uh, can do anything to help you as far as uh, rehabilitation goes. Thank you. And then the other question that I received um, is, is it possible to overdo exercises? Is there a daily suggested amount of exercises to do? Um, and can the exercises affect or bring on uh, hemorrhoids or cause any other issues? Exercises generally do not cause hemorrhoids uh, unless you're not drinking enough in relation to how much you're working out. You know, the, yes, there is. Um, too much exercise uh, can cause dehydration, um, fatigue, because you need your muscles to recover. So you need some rest as well um, the next day, perhaps. So, but um, generally, I would say 45 minutes to an hour of general exercise is a good um, time frame. Um, pelvic floor exercises. You don't need to do too many of them. Like I said, um, just pelvic floor, those contractions three times a day. Um, doing While doing anything, you could be cooking, you could be sitting, you could be driving, you just do your pelvic floor squeezes. Uh, that um, is effective. Um, and then when you incorporate it with your daily routine, like if you're doing laundry and you're going to pick up a, a basket of uh, clothes, you can just squeeze and then um, do that a few times those squeezes, uh, those are good because too much of, I think, um, pelvic floor exercises would fatigue those muscles. They could become sore, they could become hypertonic. Um, so there is a mo everything in moderation, I think. Mm 